the gap, standing for Jesus. Standing in the gap for family and friends. Standing in the gap, one love for all, so we all can make it in. Standing in the gap, standing for Jesus. Standing in the gap for family and friends. Standing in the gap, one love for all, so we all can make it in. Studying to show ourselves approved, rightly divine the word of truth, increasing our faith to envision our freedom, so we all can glorify our God. Standing in the gap. Standing for Jesus, standing in the gap for family and friends, standing in the gap, one love for all, so we all can make it in, make it in, make it in, make it in. Want to hear him say good, good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, the joy of love. Wanna hear him say good, good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say here to the joy of love. Wanna hear him say good and good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say here to the joy of love, of love, joy of love, love, joy. Christian Education uh, Ministry, Standing in the Gap, USA. We uh, stand on the Word of God and the gap that's been created between God and His people by the world, by, by those who don't follow God's Word. And so God is asking for those who are willing to stand in the gap on His Word and bring His people back to Him. And so that's what we do in this Christian ministry. We stand in the gap. So we want to welcome you. Welcome all those who are joining us by uh, this live broadcast. And welcome those who are joining us by, uh, will will join us in uh, reviewing the broadcast on social media outlets. So we, we've been uh, uh, on a study here for a little while. It's called um, the Spirit World. And the Spirit World... The reason we chose that is because a lot of people don't believe in the spirit world. They don't believe that there are spirits out there, that they are angels, that they are demons, and that they are fighting for our immortal souls. And so we, um, we, we, we started out talking about angels, and we're now talking about demons and the doors that we open in our lives to allow demons to come in. And we're working today... Uh, as we did last week on that door called money. But before we get into that, as always, let us pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you, Father. You have brought us once again safely to this point in time where we can share your word, Father, where we can stand in the gap on your word, Father, and, and through you, Father, hopefully draw some people back, back to you, away from the world and all that the world has to offer. Father, we ask you to open our hearts and open our minds, Father, and fill it with your Holy Spirit of wisdom, power, and love, Father, as we move forward into, more deeply into, the mystery of your word. We 
ask all this in your name and for your sake. Amen. 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 And we also want to pray for the family of Miss Jimmy Mae Barnes, their funeral life and hers as we speak. We ran down to Lee Chapel for the wake this morning and had an opportunity to see a lot of good old friends and uh, pay our respects, but please join us in praying for the family of Miss uh, Jimmy Mae Barnes. We should always pray for those who have been pillars of, our, of, of the church and, and sacrificing uh, their time and their effort for the work of the Lord. So, Miss Jimmy Mae Barnes, we salute you. The family that she is the matriarch of, uh, our prayers are with you. All right. Now, as always, uh, also um, understand that this uh, ministry is a collaboration, a collaboration with God, of course, but also a collaboration between me and my uh, and my wife. We're the ones who uh, come together and uh, put these put put these on, and she's our I call her IT person, the person that keeps us on the air, that keeps uh, me in in check. And making sure that we're able to produce this uh, uh, broadcast each week. And so, Marvel, do you have anything that you want to say? Good morning, Saints. Good morning. Happy Saturday to you. Um, in the chat box, there is a link to join us in our Facebook live room. We would love for you to come in and speak, and we could see your face and uh, have more interaction live. So that is in the chat box. Also in the chat box is a link to the outline. We're on outline number 11 today. So if you didn't get the email or if you didn't get a chance to download it, you can go to that link and get the outline and follow along with Brother Art. I do want to let you all know that next Saturday and the Saturday following, we will be on vacation and won't be uh, having the class. So class will resume on um, August the 20th. We will put some posts out on Facebook and whatnot, but uh, we'll have this class today. I think we're going to wrap up money, 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 and then we'll come back with a new door, scary door. So <laughs> enjoy the class. Doors that we open in our lives that allow demons to come in. We've gone through a couple of those doors, but now we're on this door of money. But also understand the reason why we're doing this is because, like I said, some people don't believe in the spirit world or don't understand it and don't understand demons and angels and what's going on. But we're in spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. We, you know, people know about physical warfare. joy in my soul. God is in control. I got Satan on my trail, but I'm singing all is well. He's attacking every day, but I'm watching while I pray. No matter the attack, I won't turn back. This means war. Oh yeah, we. Are, I guess we're anxious to get into that, um, but we are in the spiritual warfare, and uh, that's why we need to understand understand the. Uh, weapons that we're able to use in our spiritual warfare, guns and knives and swords and grenades and and uh, rocket launchers and all that don't do a bit of good in this spiritual warfare between the angels and the demons, basically God and the devil, for our immortal souls. So first thing to realize is that we are in war. We are in war. And and I like to put up a graphic to, um, to let you know the doors that we unwittingly sometimes open and what's standing behind those doors. And uh, we did music. Music was one, you know. And we're now, we did alcohol. You open those doors and demons rush in. But demons rush in because of uh, money. And it's, uh, you can't get around it because this whole uh, world seems to be built on money and if you have money or you don't have money that seems to control whatever it is so when you uh, and, and that's not to say that you can't have money but understand 
love demon that's waiting behind that to attack you when you go after money. All right, so uh, this graphic kind of kind of illustrates that, but I like to show another graphic that I hope brings it home. Yeah, money, 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 money. The demons at the door because those demons are waiting to bring hell into your life. And I think this uh, graphic here more um, adequately uh, reflects what it is I'm trying to say with the uh, demons at the door. And I call this one the demon monster at the door, waiting for you to crack that door because of money. And you know what? Let's, let's just be truthful. Money kind of controls things. And and people don't know how to handle it. It's, it's too much. This whole world is built on it. And if you have it, you don't have it, all that kind of thing. But money. And they say it's the a root of either all evil or all kinds of evil. The love of money. The love of money. Do bad things with it. And as, remember, you know, we, we look at people, but our our battle is not against flesh and blood. The person is being controlled by demons. And so when when money gets in there, that demon money gets in there and starts controlling people's lives, you know, we always deal with the person and not a lot of times dealing with the root of the problem, which is a spiritual problem, a demonic problem. And we have to attack that in uh, uh, different ways than we do um, uh, normally in a, in a war. Now, let, now let me ask you this. I ask you the question. Since we go, we'll 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 get right back. In, I mean, right into this. I ask you a question. Did God promise you wealth? You see, that's something that has been debated and uh, preached on, and people follow that road of. Uh, God put me here uh, so I could I could be wealthy and um, all that kind of thing, and it's it's caused problems. It's called problems. But let me ask you: Have you ever heard of what's called the um, prosperity gospel? Prosperity gospel, and and um, let me define prosperity gospel for you. Um, we. Um, prosperity, you should understand, um, in gospel, um, means, did God, basically, did God promise you prosperity here? Now, I, I went to Wikipedia, a lot of people go to Wikipedia to try to define what something means, and since a lot of people do that, I did that. Went there to try to see if I could give you an explanation of what it is for those that aren't aware of what, what it is, um. There you go. Prosperity theology, sometimes referred to as prosperity gospel, the health and wealth gospel, the gospel of success, or seed faith. It's a religious belief among some Protestant Christians that financial blessings and physical well-being are always the will of God for them, and that faith, positive speech, and donations to religious causes will increase one's material wealth. Material, and especially financial success, is seen as a sign of divine favor. Now, I want to go back over that just a little bit because it's the way it, it, uh, this definition breaks down is that um, uh, you can get prosperity by positive speech, faith, positive speech, donations, to religious causes and all that. But understand, remember, we've, we've always taught, and it's always been taught, that your works are not what gets you the blessings of God. It is your faith. It is your faith. And the faith, he looks at your heart, not at your words. And so, to a certain extent, this definition of prosperity gospel kind of goes against theology. 
when you say, well, it is Wikipedia. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> but uh, you have to, we have to make sure that every time they cross over the bounds that we, that we bring them back to understand. So if this is actually the definition of prosperity theology, let's say Wikipedia is right. If it's act, this is actually the definition, then um, uh, intrinsic in this definition is something that goes against Scripture. Against Scripture. It's not your works. It's not your uh, donations, uh, uh, your positive speech, and all that kind of thing. Because some people say, well, I guess I can get prosperity by um, talking positively. Saying I have faith or I can donate to religious causes and then I'll get the money or the prosperity back. That's really not what it's about. So, you know, last week we talked about a uh, scene from the Bible. Um, it's called the rich, the young rich, the rich young ruler. And uh, basically, if you remember the uh, scripture, the um, rich young ruler, he was a Pharisee or something. He was, he was a ruler. And he goes to Jesus and wants to know what is it going to take for me to get into heaven? And Jesus tells him to keep the commandments. And he basically, and he says, I've, I've kept them all my life, so I should be good. And Jesus looked down into his heart, of course, and he said, you know, for you, there's one other thing you need to do. You need to give up all of your possessions. Give them to the poor. Come and follow me. Because what he saw in that man, when he looked down deep in his soul, is that the um, money that he had, the wealth, that he had was going to keep him out of the kingdom. And you say, oh, okay. And 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 his uh, disciples say, well, well, gee, Jesus, then uh, who can be saved? And Jesus tells them, you know, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So basically, and, and when you look at that scripture, you'll see that, uh, 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 that graphic, this man turned his back and walked away from Jesus when Jesus told him to give up all his money. And he didn't realize it, but what he was walking away from was the word. He was walking away from eternal life, which is what he called himself wanting to achieve. And so, yeah, and people say, well, that was way back then, you know, and, uh, and uh, uh, 2000, over 2,000 years ago. Well, Let's bring it up to today. And this graphic uh, shows in the background that time when that young ruler would have walked away from Jesus. But in the foreground shows us, brings us up to today. And so this is a uh, depiction of the modern young ruler who has wealth and uh, prosperity and all that. And he's doing well, but Jesus is talking to him too. And Jesus doesn't change. What he told that rich young ruler back in the day, he's telling us today. Because that rich young ruler had a love of money and prosperity. And don't tell me, you can't tell me that these people today who have riches and prosperity don't have a love for money also. But just like back then, if you want to get in to heaven, you can't have that love of money. You cannot have it. And so that's what he's telling the young, rich young ruler of today. And the question is, well, this rich young ruler of today, and, and understand, he ain't talking about just rulers. He's talking about you and me. Because to a certain extent, we all have a measure of wealth. And the question, and, and to a certain extent, we're all trying to get a little more. The question is, do you love money? Because you can't love God and money. Can't, but can't the Bible happen. says, "You you 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 love the one, hate the other, and uh, hate the hate the one, love the other, and all that." So, uh, can't do it. So he may look at you when you ask him the same question as, "How do I get into heaven? I've, I've led a good life, and all this." And Jesus will say, "Yeah, there's one more thing you need to do." And you know, you wonder why there's a gap between God and, and his people? Because people 
don't want to give up that love of what they have. They want to keep that and also make it on into heaven. And uh, as the scriptures say, it's very difficult for a rich man <laughs> to make it into heaven. That's as difficult as trying to bring a camel through the eye of a needle. Doesn't say you can't get there. It says it's very, very, very difficult. Okay. All right. Now, let's go to uh, Timothy. Because rich young ruler and all that that we talk about, Timothy talks about your preachers, the people in charge of your churches, all those. That could be your, could be your preacher. Could be your Sunday school teacher. Could be the head of your usher board. Could be anyone who finds himself in a position of authority in the church. And what it says, what Timothy says, is that the overseer, whoever it is that's overseeing whatever part of the church that is, and that starts with the pastor, trustees, steward, deacons, all that kind of thing, they should be above reproach. Faithful to his wife. Temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome. And here we go. Not a lover of money. You see, this lover of money thing is uh, very, very important. And when he talks about overseers, let's, let's, and, and it's not that we're giving the, the uh, uh, Sunday school teacher a pass, or we're giving the deacons a pass, now, but let's focus on the ones who are, who, who are in charge of the flock, the preachers. Because this prosperity um, theology that we're talking about comes from the top. So let's get into it. Let's get into it. We're going to give you, uh, I've asked um, uh, Marvel to tee up a, uh, a, a video that will introduce us, get us down into prosperity. Today. Fresh wind, fresh. They are some of the most popular TV preachers in the country. We're family here. They urge the faithful followers to donate generously, and in return, the Lord will bring them prosperity. I'm not going to be going to heaven and be broke when I get there. And there's no denying some people have prospered handsomely. Wow! The now pastors themselves, the they live like rock stars with huge mansions, private jets, and fancy cars. Their lifestyles are so lavish, six of them have been investigated by the U.S. Senate. Like Paula White, who lives in multi-million dollar homes in New York City and Tampa, Florida. And Creflo Dollar, he gets around in style, flying in private jets to preach around the country. He owns this mansion in an exclusive Atlanta suburb. Mr. Dollar, how do you Not one of them would agree to an interview about their opulent lifestyle. How do you justify your million dollar mansions in your jets to all of your donors, sir. Oh, yeah. But when it comes to opulence, few religious leaders compare to Kenneth Copeland. You and I are supposed to always have. To show you his house, we rented this helicopter so you can see his 18,000 square foot mansion valued at over $6 million. He lives in this home outside Fort Worth, Texas. It has beautiful water views and comes complete with a boathouse. But that's not all. Copeland is an avid pilot, and here's his pride and joy, a $20 million Cessna Citation jet. It's the fastest private jet money can buy. He said he needed it to better serve the Lord, and proudly did a flyby for his followers after the church bought it. But it's not just one plane. We found a fleet of planes registered to the church. And you won't catch him waiting in line at the airport because he's got his own, the Kenneth Copeland Airport, located right next to his mansion. I think Copeland is unbelievably greedy. 
I, I want to I want to be zealous for the sake of the souls of the people I pastor when it comes to materialism in first Timothy six when it says the desire for riches plunges one into destruction to see I want them to see that their possessions and their pursuit of money can be dangerous and even damning I want to I want to I want to I want to show that with a sharp edge so to speak which I think the word the word brings about Matthew 19 23 through 24 then Jesus said to his disciples I tell you the truth it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven again I tell you it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God now this is a very stout teaching here and I want to remind you, this is the story of the rich young man who comes to Jesus and says, Lord, what must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus tells him to obey the commands. He basically says, Lord, I've kept all those. What else do I lack? And Jesus says, if you want to be complete, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. And the young man walks away frustrated and sad, the Bible says, because he was a man of great wealth. The point of the story is, is that a man walked away from eternal life because he had in that moment chosen money as his God rather than God as God. So now, what is the real truth here? How are we to view money? Is it possible that all rich people cannot go to heaven? Does that mean if I have plenty of extra in reserve that somehow or another I'm out of God's will and I'm out of following God's ways? Does it mean that I need to not have anything and that if I have nothing and I live a life of poverty, that God is more pleased? What is the answer to this? Is there something in between? I want to show you some of the stuff that's being taught out here. And I basically am going to juxtapose for you in these video clips you're going to see. I'm going to juxtapose the two opposing uh, positions on this, the two extremes, if you will. Let's take a look. Why would anybody criticize you for preaching prosperity? Because what kind of God wants you to be poor and miserable? So Oprah proposes the idea that God couldn't possibly be good if people are poor and, quote, miserable. Let's take a look at what God's Word says about this. James 2, 5. Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? Would it not be slandering of the noble name of God to say what kind of God wants you to be poor and miserable? Well, first of all, God doesn't desire that people be poor and miserable. But there are people who, as this scripture points out, who are poor in the eyes of the world. Hello, you're looking at one of those. Do not be fooled for a minute. In the eyes of the world, I am absolutely beyond poor. I went over a year and two months without a cell phone. I'm not saying that to you so you can feel sorry for me. It was something I chose out of obedience to God. And I didn't have the extra money because I was busy doing ministry work. So I went an entire year without a cell phone. My friend, that in America is beyond poor. There are people in third world countries that have cell phones now as a basic necessity of life. I went a whole year without one, but I was not poor and miserable in God's eyes. I began to become rich in faith. I might say I became rich, so I rather I became poor so that others are now becoming rich. Okay, let's move on. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Jesus here pointing out that there's a spiritual wealth that you have yet to attain that you may look upon your outside circumstances, you rich people you, not realizing that you are depraved, poor, and pitiful. And the day of finding that out will come. It's unfortunate. So one time I was at a friend of mine's house and they had given me this book called Sun Stand Still by Pastor Stephen Furtick. I started to read the book within just a few pages. I very quickly concluded this is a person who is a false teacher who is teaching people what they want to hear. 
There's certainly truth in the message, but it's primarily a message, and you have this discernment. You can just immediately tell. I gave the book back to my friend. My friend really did not want to hear that message from me. Nevertheless, in love, I said, I just want to let you know that's not a book I would read or a book that I would endorse. Now take a quick look at this clip. Tonight, an iTeam exclusive, a mega house from mega church pastor. NBC Charlotte's iTeam has confirmed that Elevation Church pastor Stephen Furtick is building a 16,000 square foot home in Weddington. In this next clip, you're going to see a very outspoken, very brash prosperity teacher. I found out that he was coming to a local city here and that some people I had known from a church I used to attend were, were headed that way. And I tried to warn him. I said, you know, please don't go see this guy. Don't go listen to teaching that is perverted like that. You, why even put that stuff in your mind and in your heart? And of course, when they came back, somebody had shared the testimony that that night that this man had come to town, he actually said to everybody, listen, I normally don't ask people for money for things like this, but I checked in with the Lord and the Lord gave me permission and told me to ask everybody tonight, my jet needs a $400,000 maintenance on it, and I need to raise the money to do that. I almost didn't even know what to say. Here's another clip. I got criticized that day about my house. This guy said, I, I, I don't think you ought to have a house. I said, no, you love my house. You don't like your house. <laughs> That's your problem. Because you're looking at mine every day. Now, if I gave you my house, you'd shout. I said, so keep looking at it. It may increase your faith one day. I got criticized that day about my house. This guy said, I, I, I don't think you ought to have a house. I said, no, you love my house. You don't like your house. That's your problem. Because you're looking at mine every day. Now, if I gave you my house, you'd shout. I said, so keep looking at it. It may increase your faith one day. So my question would be, does it increase your faith in a way that pleases God? Or is this more likely to be a spirit of enticement to get you to desire things in your life that God says you can do without and be completely fulfilled without? You see, you have to be very, very cautious about when we hear these messages. They're very appealing to our natural sin nature. Take a look at this scripture. Speaking of false teachers, Peter says, These men are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error, meaning non-believers. This is a spirit of enticement behind these teachings. There is a time when I wanted to hear that God wanted to make me wealthy, and I'm going to stop and tell you just a quick story. There was a time when I really believed, I was very sincere in my belief, that God was going to make me very wealthy, but not just so that I could have all this money, but so that he could showcase his faithfulness to me. I really believed that God needed for me, God bless my heart for thinking this, to have money so that people would actually believe what I was telling them. I made the conclusion in my mind, A plus B equals C. If I have money, plus a platform of which to showcase that on, people will believe the message that I'm telling them about God. And I had convinced myself that this was the case. Now, I want to contrast that thinking with God's thinking. Maybe you've heard of the professional golfer named Vijay Singh. He's one of the winningest money-wise golfers in all of golf. I was living shortly after the divorce with his golf caddy named David Clark in a town called Lake Nona, Florida. It's a very upscale, very prestigious golfing community. And for a time, I needed to live with David and a friend of mine who was a roommate there with him. So in the mornings, I would go for prayer walks trying to figure out which way was up, totally disillusioned by the fact that my life was falling apart. My wife had just left. All of the money was taken by my ex-wife. She had control over our business finances and our personal checking account, which she had closed right around the time of filing for divorce. So now I have no business, no access to my income, no personal money. I had nothing. And at that time, we had just come out of a season of liquidating a lot of our resources, simplifying our life, because that's what God had been doing in my heart. Cool off this lifestyle, simplify things. You don't need all this stuff, Michael. So I had been on that venture for about a year, getting rid of things, simplifying stuff. So I didn't have hardly anything by way of possessions. So one morning, I'm walking down the sidewalk, 
And I was just crying my eyes out because I had $23 in my checking account. And that was all the money I had in the entire world. Whoo, I can still feel the emotion for that guy. Man, I was so upset and I began to just cry. And I said, Father, how can this be? How can this be? And the whole time I'm having visuals in my head of when I had all of this money coming in and I had this visual image of me holding the check for $250,000 that was made out to my little debt-free company that I owned. It was a deal that I sold, so I didn't have to pay anybody any commission on it. I owned the company debt-free and I sold a private label of technology, so the money was pure profit. It wasn't like I received the check for $250,000, but it cost me one hundred and fifty dollars to make it. It was pure profit, and it was only a 50% deposit on a sale that was a half a million dollars. And I'm, the money was flowing in, and I wasn't taking a lot of money for myself at all. I would just put it back into growing the company, because I concluded, if we're making this much now, we're going to be making this much next year. So I wasn't wild. I just put it all back into the company. Payroll, expenses, all that stuff. Staying on track. I said, God, I'm ruined. I have $23 in my checking account. How in the world did I get from where I had all this money coming in with this successful business that you had given me to now I have a total net worth of $23 and, and nothing's changing about that for days and that's all the money I have in the whole world? I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified. So I keep walking and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just spoke loud and clear to me in the middle of my prayer, these words, Michael, you are far more useful to me right now with that $23 in your checking account than you ever were with a quarter of a million. I want you to understand, I did not have the ability Basically, we're going to get into, down into it, but we're going to do it. There's going to be a couple of videos today that we're going to talk about the prosperity of uh, gospel. As you know, one, one point that was made there is the overwhelming amount of money that, that preachers are bringing in, either to their church, and, uh, and a lot of them will say, well, it's for, to promote my ministry and all that then why do you need that huge house up there on the hill? Why do you need a, a, a jet plane, two jet planes, or some Rolls Royces and all that kind of thing? See, at some point in time, it, it, turns, old, it turns from uh, 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 money as a blessing to me to a love of money at some point in time. And you know what? I know there was a clip on there. Uh, who'd they show? They showed, um, uh, was Joel? I thought I saw Joel. I thought it was Joel. Uh-huh. And was Creflo on there? Yeah, Creflo was in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And uh, those people who have so much money. And then, I mean, their ministry has so much money. But then you look at them and they have so much money. Now, let's, let's, let's go on be... Uh, be before them because you know today we look at Joel, we look at Creflo, we look at TV, uh, TV and all that and the amount of money that they're raking in. But I'm I'm, I'm going to ask Marvel to uh, key up uh, somebody who's even before that, and a lot of you know who this person is and, and uh, what we're talking about. Joining us in the first portion of the show is the famous Reverend Ike, the founder and senior minister of the United Christian Evangelistic Association. Reverend Ike has two new series of cassettes out. One is called Thank God for Money, the other Your Power of Visualization. And one must say this about Reverend Ike. You may be the most honest of all of the television preachers since all of them are in a sense out for money. You're the only one saying it. Do you ever get that feeling? Well, that sometimes I think uh, I... I am less apologetic in my attitude toward money. You know, the Apostle Paul said, 
that the love of money is the root of all evil until I came along to correct him. It, it is the love, it is the lack of money more than the love of money mm -hmm. that is the root of all evil. I think people do more evil things because of the lack of money than because of the plentitude of money. But how do you react when people say that Ike bases his whole ministry on the dollar and making him rich? Well, they are correct. Uh, in a sense, I got to say that for you. Uh, first of all, make you rich, and that'll make them happy. Uh, first of all, I got into this business of praying for people to get money and teaching people to get money, because in my ministry, I found out that that was people's greatest problem, and I believe and I know that Jesus met people at the point of their need. Whatever their need was, Jesus met that need. When people were hungry, He provided bread, and there is a case in the Gospels where the Apostle came to Jesus and said, Lord, we don't have money to pay our taxes. This is tax day, by the way. And Jesus told Peter to go fishing, and he would find money in the fish's mouth. And so, frankly, the Bible is a book of prosperity. The Bible also says, and God says this in the Bible, Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. But Jesus didn't get rich. The, well, the preacher didn't get rich. In other words, how would you react to, uh, to, to uh, what Lenny, Lenny Bruce once said, which is that any person who says that he got a calling from God to preach the word, who has more than one suit while somebody has no clothes, is a cop-out. I disagree with that because there are a lot of people who don't want a suit. We all don't want the same thing. There are people who don't want Rolls Royces. But just because other people don't want a suit, that should not be imposed upon me. Yeah, I know, but if you're leading me to a better world and, and giving you a Rolls Royce makes it a better world for you, and you ask me to help you get a Rolls Royce. I've also taught many people to get their own Rolls Royces. One of my very good supporters uh, has me to give away Rolls Royces for them every year at their beauty show because I help to motivate them to start their own beauty products business on their own kitchen stove. And several times a year they take over the Rolls Royce dealership in New York and have me present the key to new Rolls Royces to people who have sold millions of dollars worth of their products. To your credit, do you think that of, of the television ministries, you are the most honest? I'm not touchy about money. I don't apologize for my success and my prosperity. And most preachers are apologetic about it because they care what people think. I don't apologize for my success and prosperity because I remember growing up in South Carolina when lunch was seven cents a day and I didn't have seven cents for lunch. And it was always one of my prayers to get to the point where I could fulfill the 23rd Psalm where it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But you have no guilt over being rich. No guilt because I teach success and prosperity. I feel called of God to teach and to preach success and prosperity without apology. And that is my calling. There was a joke going around some time ago that says, if you want to be saved, see Billy Graham. If you want to be healed, see Oral Roberts. If you want money, see Reverend Ike. Quelling <laughs> wisdom. You have no, say, guilt over Rolls Royces? Absolutely not. Why How can I teach? One? How can I teach success and prosperity unless, success. unless I am an example? And only people who are really, well, I, I don't like to put it this way, but, but here it is where it's at. People who are envious object to success and fr prosperity. And you can't help them until they give up their envy anyway. Let's talk about it. Reverend Ike. Reverend Ike had a huge uh, congregation and money. And he was one of the first black televangelists. You know, the televangelists came about as you know, evangelists who used television and all that. I mean, if you remember, Billy Graham, was he was not necessarily a televangelist. I mean, he would go around and have these, these big uh, and stadiums and have this huge number of people that were uh, coming to see him. And a lot of those were uh, taped and put on, um, on, on television, but he, he, was, he was not necessarily a televangelist. This thing about the televangelist came a little later with uh, uh, Baker and, and uh, all them, and maybe even um, uh, Oral Roberts and, and uh, that kind of thing. 
where they use the medium of television to promote exactly what it is that they were doing and using it to rake money in. Money, money was coming in at uh, in, in, at horrendous rates and, and so much money that, that these uh, televangelists, these preachers, will fly all around the country, some of them to other countries and all that, and um, uh, do their ministry and um, made a lot of money. And a lot of money came to them, came to them. And so, and Reverend Ike was actually one who um, was un unapologetic about it. Uh, let me read. You have you have ten. By the way, you you believe in the Ten Commandments, right? Absolutely. Yeah. But you have ten commandments of money. I just want to say yes. these are correct. Thou shalt not think that money is evil. Thou shalt not speak evil of money. Thou shalt do right about money. Thou sh thou shalt give right about money. Thou shalt not serve money. Rather, shall serve you. Thou shalt not be aware that money loves you. Thou shalt not fear money, that it will corrupt you. Thou shalt not deny money. If you deny money, money will deny you. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt see to it that thy money makes money. Thou shalt not seek something for nothing. Absolutely. This is all uh, very, very, very mercenary. It is indeed, and in this world, it requires money. Money has its place. Remember, Jesus said, "Seek you first the kingdom of God." That's the spiritual aspect of life. And we teach this. I just finished an eight-day series on spiritual priority at our church and school in New York. But Jesus says when you find the spiritual part within, the God within, then all of the things shall be added unto you. On these tapes, you're, you're showing people how they can make money? Absolutely. Must they be believers? Well, they have to believe in themselves. You see, I don't... No, uh, no, you don't know But, you know what? And, and and that's not just to say that, I mean, if everything's on the up and up and all that, then, then and you're doing the thing that you need to do, then maybe you shouldn't have any guilt over that, over, over money that's coming in. The problem I have with it is not so much of the money that's coming into the church, it's the amount that's being lavished on that, on that preacher. And more than, more than he ever needs. It's, it's so much. And so we get right back down to, are we dealing with uh, 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 the love of money as opposed to the love of God? And remember, the devil is uh, masquerades as, a, uh, as an angel. As an angel. And so when you start uh, combining the... Um, uh, love of money or, or the money issue with the scripture and all that, you can influence a lot of people. I don't know if we're ready for the next one. Don't teach people to believe in a God in the sky or to believe in just simply a God in me, but the God that is within. As I interpret Jesus, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. And to me, Jesus was saying, Every man is one with God. And I. And uh, Jesus is talking to his uh, to his disciple. And, and remember, add add to that the scripture on the rich young ruler. Add it into this, where Jesus said, "Truly, I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God." And 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 what is Jesus talking about? What he's saying is, is the love of money. Okay, you rich. And it's difficult for you to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let me ask you this question. How much more difficult is it for you who uh, are rich and a preacher to enter into the kingdom? Now, a lot of preachers are un unapologetic, like uh, Reverend Ike, as for the amount of, 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 of money that he has uh, in his own pocket as a result of, 
of his um, his efforts. And uh, one of the clips, I don't know if we'll be able to see it, but one of the clips he talks about when he got into this business. And and, and that kind of struck me because I said, wait a minute, this is a business? You look at this as a business? And and, and maybe that's why, why you're looking at it as making all the money that you can get if it's a business. And so... You know, just 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 keep in mind, it's hard for anybody who's rich to get into the kingdom of heaven because of the love of money. It's even much more. It's even much harder for a preacher because what what the preacher is doing is trying to justify his love of money for why he has all his money. And remember what we said in the. Uh, 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 previous script, Timothy 3.3, 3, maybe we can go back to that. Let's see if we can go back to that. About the overseer being above reproach, meaning that uh, impropriety, you have to, you have to be uh, uh, beyond the appearance of impropriety. And you say, well, I'm doing everything right, my heart is right, and all that, but to the people that are out there looking at you, you you, uh, you're not a beyond impropriety. They look at you and they look down at you because they look at you as maybe love and money and you say, maybe I'm not. But to them, you are. And so they heap uh, uh, insults upon you. And not only you, upon, upon uh, on, uh, uh, the gospel. Because here you are supposedly spouting the gospel. So to a certain extent, by you out here with your 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 uh, private claims and with your uh, huge mansions and uh, uh, huge bank accounts, uh, you're you're uh, it looks like impropriety. He even say, uh, Reverend Ike would even say that, hey, I deserve all this money I'm getting. And and you see, people people don't look at it that way. So if we look at Timothy 3.3, 3, it says not a lover of money. And that's what is, is, is coming out when you, uh, when you go down that road. And it's difficult for him now for these other televangelists, whether it's Osteen, whether it's uh, Jake's or whatever, it's going to be very difficult for them to get into, the, uh, to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I know some people are going to say, oh, no, I, I'm not saying they're not going to get there. I'm saying it's going to be very difficult for them to get there. Um, and, that, and, and that's what's so dangerous about this um, prosperity gospel. Now, um, there's another video from one of our friends, uh, Reverend Parr. Same thing that we're talking about is the prosperity gospel. You can't, you really have no justification for the amount of wealth that you're getting over and above the, uh, the wealth you need. That's why Jesus is saying the thing for you to do is get rid of all that and give it to the poor. And then come follow me. That's, that's why he's saying that. But you have these preachers who um, are trying to justify why they are entitled to have all this money and um, is because of the good things they're doing for God. Now, understand this. It's not only trying to justify um, 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 their wealth. They're trying to convince you that if you do this and this and this and this, then you can have this prosperity too. You can have this wealth too. And understand, we we talk about money, but when they talk about prosperity, they're talking about your health also. You know, uh, 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 you won't be suffering from all this that you're suffering from if you just do this, 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 and this. Now, like I said before, that interferes with the um, with with the word of the gospel that that uh, state that your works aren't what um, what get you in to the kingdom of heaven. Because uh, another part of scripture says that your works 
to God are like filthy rags. Like filthy rags. And so when they Does God promise us health and wealth? That's our topic today on The Beat. Hey everyone, my name is Alan Parr. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Here on The Beat, we release a new video every single Tuesday, and today we are hitting on a topic that I have been personally wanting to deal with for some time. It's super controversial. Does the Bible teach and promise that every Christian should be healthy and wealthy? You know, the Bible says that in the last days, that people will flock to teachers who are preaching to them things that their itching ears want to here. And so today I want to share with you five major problems that I personally have with this health and wealth prosperity gospel. Number one, it is inconsistent with what the Bible teaches. On the contrary, it says that in this Christian life, we can expect to experience tribulation, suffering, and pain. Elsewhere, it also highlights the fact that there will be poor believers among us and that we should esteem them rather than making them feel like second-class Christians. In addition to this, the Bible says that it's not until eternity where God will wipe away all tears, all pain, and all sorrow, indicating that we will not experience our best life now here on earth, but rather for eternity. Many people will point to the promises in the book of Deuteronomy to support the idea that God's will is for us to be healthy. But we must remember that those promises were given to nations and not individuals, which leads me to this last idea, which is the idea that we must be careful, as you've heard me say on this channel before, not to take isolated scriptures or isolated events and take them out of context and say that they must be the normative experience for every single Christian. The second problem that I have with the prosperity gospel, besides the fact that it's not biblical, is that it switches our focus. In other words, instead of us being consumed with asking God, what can and should I be doing for you? It switches our focus to now asking God what he needs to be doing for us, which in turn puts him in the place of being some spiritual genie who only exists to make us happy. Number three, it sets people up for major disappointment in God. And so what ends up happening is these churches and these pastors are telling their members that God is going to do this for you. He's going to bless you with health. He's going to bless you with wealth. And then when it's not their reality or the reality of their loved ones, they are told that they didn't receive it because they didn't have enough faith, which in my opinion is super offensive to people who may be poor or people who are dealing with terminal illnesses or have loved ones who are dealing with terminal illnesses, or they are left to believe that God reneged on their promise insinuating that God promised them something that he never gave them. Number four, this concept of prosperity is limited primarily to the Western world. Statistics show that 84% of the world's population is living in poverty, which means they're living on less than $10 per day. And so we have millions of Christians across the world who are born into poverty, and many of them are being stricken with diseases because they do not have clean water or access to adequate health care. And so you have this false teaching that is promoting this idea that these Christians are second class Christians, even though they are near and dear to God's heart and that they are less blessed and they are less spiritual than those of us who have access to wealth and adequate health care. Number five, this teaching is inconsistent with Jesus' life and the life of his disciples. The apostle Paul admits to having what he calls a thorn in his flesh, and most scholars do agree that it was some sort of physical infirmity that hindered his ministry. The Bible says that Jesus was a carpenter, which was clearly not an affluent career in his day. It also says that Jesus was a traveling preacher, and half of the time he didn't even know at night where he was going to lay his Head. It also teaches that Jesus was living primarily off of the benevolence of others. Finally, it says that his life was characterized by pain and sorrow and ultimately death on a cross. So guys, I'm in no way suggesting that we serve a God who is not able to heal us or bless us with wealth if that be his will. I'm also not suggesting that God wants us to be poor, broke down, and sick. But what I am suggesting is that if we go through seasons of our life where we find ourselves in those difficult situations, it is God's desire that we glorify him just as much as we would if we were living in perfect health and wealth.
Guys, this is a super controversial subject and one that so many Christians are confused about. So I would love to hear your thoughts, your questions. Leave them in the comment section below. Hey, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on The Beat. They try to justify the amount of money that they have in their pocket. Then what can you say? What can you say? Um, other than, okay, I got it, but you can have it too. Now, what that does is uh, open you up to saying, oh, okay, well, let me do all this and all this and all this, and then I'll get this too. And then let's say you do this, 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 and that, and you don't get it. And you don't get it. For one, it's probably going to be depressing to you. And two, you're going to probably turn against what this preacher or overseer is telling you is the truth. And you look at him, well, why does he have it? You see, you see, it's, it's, it's very difficult for a rich man to get into heaven. It's very difficult also for a poor man who's trying to get rich to get into heaven when he's searching after and, and uh, uh, chasing money, the love of money. All right. Well, um, I'm glad we got that in. Reverend Parr is a very good uh, 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 preacher and teacher. And um, what I have up on the screen right now is uh, Timothy, 1 Timothy 6.10, which I, is, a, is a great graphic to show those chasing money. You're going to chase money, then if it's the love of money, it's not going to work out well for you. You you covet it. You 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 erred from the faith and pierced yourself with many sorrows. So now we all know. I mean, one of the uh, uh, I guess mega preachers now, one of the top ones out there. Everybody knows. And when I when I when I hear people talk about them, they they really seem to have a compassion for this for this guy. Is Joel Olstein, okay? I mean, some people swear by Joel Olstein, okay? Joel Olstein is one of these prosperity preachers, okay? Now I'm going to call on Reverend Parr again, so he can tell us, um, and and not in an insulting way, but a teaching way, about this prosperity gospel mega preacher. I'm going to keep this introductory question very simple and short. Should Christians listen to Joel Osteen? That is coming up today on The Beat. Hey my friend, welcome back to The Beat. My name is Alan Parr. Thank you so much for tuning in. If this is your first time here, it's a pleasure. If you want a free ebook, click the link in the description box below. If you enjoy this video, consider subscribing. Hit that little bell notification so you won't miss a beat. Okay, so before I actually get into this question, I need to make a few things very clear. First of all, the purpose of this video is not to malign or bash or slander Joel Osteen in terms of his character, in terms of him as a person. The purpose of this video is to simply inform you of the facts and look at what Joel Osteen is saying and assess the truth of what he's saying as it lines up and relates to the truth that has been revealed in the Word of God. That is the purpose of this video. And my goal is hopefully that as we go through these things, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you whether it is right for you or not for you to listen to Joel Osteen. Now, the second thing that I want to point out is this. Some people may have an issue. They may call me divisive. That's okay. I can live with that. But they may have an issue with me actually calling out another minister by name and saying, you know what? You should not do that. But there is a clear precedent and pattern in scripture that we see that the Apostle Paul and other New Testament writers were clearly calling out certain individual false teachers by name and warning their flock and their congregation to be aware and avoid the false teaching that these false teachers were promoting. Here are a couple of scriptures to support this. 1 Timothy chapter 1 says, holding on to faith and a good conscience, 
which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Now, who are these people that have ex experienced the shipwreck of their faith? He says, among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander. So he names these two people and he says, hey, you need to avoid these guys because they're going down a wrong path. Also in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 and 15, and then I'm gonna get to six things, facts about Joel Osteen uh, in terms of whether his doctrine is consistent with the scriptures. It says here, Alexander the metal worker did me great harm, great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. So once again, we see Paul calling out people by name, saying you need to be careful, you need to avoid their doctrine. So here are six facts about Joel Osteen that I wanna encourage you to consider if you are consistently listening to him or other pastors that have a similar style or message or theology as Joel Osteen. Fact number one is that Joel Osteen does not preach from the majority of the Bible. Now, this is not just a frustration that I have with Joel Osteen. This is a frustration that I have with a lot of pastors because basically the statistics show that most pastors probably only preach from about two to 5% of the Bible, which means they're ignoring about 90 to 95% of the rest of the Bible, which means if you're only getting instruction from this one teacher, then that means that you're getting a very limited perspective or diet of the entire Bible, which means you're gonna consistently struggle to grow because the Bible says that all scripture is God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness so that the man of woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Bible says if you really want to be mature, then you need to be in a church where the pastor is bringing the majority of the Bible to you so that you can grow. Now, along those same lines, the second fact is this. Not only does he not preach from the majority of the Bible, but when he does use the Bible in his sermons, it's very few and far in between, meaning he only uses a few verses of scripture in the in his sermons and even in that regard he does not expound upon those verses very often he merely uh, references them or mentions them in passing but never actually teaches you how to actually understand that scripture and the context in which that scripture is used in other words it's a very shallow explanation of the scriptures that are being used and his premise is that the majority of people who come to church are really in the shallow end of their Christianity anyway. And so if you go deeper in any uh, shape or form, then you're gonna lose the majority of the people. But the problem is this, even though most people do come to church on a shallow level in terms of their understanding of God, our job as pastors is to take them from where they are and to help them grow and mature to a greater place of spiritual maturity. But if every time they come to church, they're hearing a maximum of only one or two scriptures in a 30 to 45 minute sermon, that is not going to be sufficient if all they're getting every week is simply teaching from one pastor to grow them spiritually. Now, the next four facts about Joel Osteen, I really want you to pay attention to and ask yourself, do I need to be listening to this type of teaching? Fact number three is that Joel Osteen seldom preaches against sin. Now, once again, the Bible says that we should preach the word in season and out of season, which basically means whether it's popular or whether it's not, whether people want to hear it or whether they don't, whether it offends them or whether it doesn't, whether it brings to a, them to a point of tears and conviction and guilt, or whether it does not. We are supposed to preach the entire word of God. Now, when asked why he does not preach about sin, he admitted that he does not, and he says, and I quote, I don't believe I'm supposed to beat people down. Most people know what they are doing wrong. In another interview, he said, I feel like people get beat up all week. I just believe whenever they come to church, they should be encouraged. Now, as a minister and as a pastor, this is the absolute wrong perspective to have because this is not true. 
Unbelievers don't know what they're doing wrong. That's the whole purpose. Do you think that unbelievers who are sleeping with people before they're married believe that it's wrong? Do you think that people who are engaging in same-sex relationships or getting married to people of same sex to believe and understand that what they're doing is wrong? Do you believe that when people are using vile language that they understand that it's wrong? Do you believe that that unbeliever that comes to church that's looking at pornography and doesn't see any just looks at it and, and doesn't think anything of it actually understands that what they're doing is wrong that is the problem right there unbelievers don't know what they are doing wrong because they do not have the holy spirit inside of them to convict them of their sinful ways they don't even understand that what they're doing is considered sin at all they look at the guy that blows up a middle school or goes in and shoots and kills a whole bunch of kids that guy's a sinner he did something wrong but me oh no there's nothing wrong with me. So to be in a ministry that consistently believes that every Sunday you just need to be encouraged and you're never really challenged to, to really deal with the sin in your life, once again, means that you are severely limiting your spiritual growth. Now, reasons four, five, and six are probably the strongest things that I really want you to consider and take away from this Video. So I want to encourage you to listen carefully. Reason number four is that Joel Osteen preaches what's called the law of attraction. Now, this is the idea that you and I can experience good things in our life if we focus our mind and our thoughts on these good things. And if we do that enough, then we will attract these good things to our, our lives and we will have the life that we desire. The problem with this law of attraction beyond it being something that secular new age people came up with is the fact that it is nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does it suggest that we can think something and if we think it up enough and if we focus on our words enough, we can attract good things or good energy or good vibes our way simply by focusing our attention and our mind on the words that we actually speak. Let me share with you a few questions quotes that Joel Osteen has gone on record to say, some of which can be found in his book, Your Best Life Now. And that title alone, I have problems with that because how can this be your best life now if you're a believer? We know that the Bible says that you're going to have trouble in this life. The Bible says that there is going to be a better life in heaven. But moving on from that, he says, anyone can create by faith in words, the dreams he desires, health, wealth, happiness, success, etc. So notice he's saying, if you have enough faith in your words, then you can create the life that you want to have. He also says, get your thinking positive and he will bring your desires to pass. That's all you got to do. If you just think positive, if you just have a positive self-talk, then God will bring everything to pass that you want. Now, here's another interesting one. God has already done everything he's going to do. The ball is in your court. So what he's saying here, once again, is that God isn't going to do anything more for you. If you want anything else to happen in your life, don't trust God. Trust in your words because the ball is in your court. If it doesn't happen, it's because you didn't do enough. You didn't speak enough. You didn't decree enough. You didn't claim enough. You didn't name enough. You didn't declare enough. You didn't believe enough. You didn't have enough faith enough because buddy, the ball is in your court. Once again, is this someone that you need to put yourself under on a consistent basis? Now, fact number five about Joel Osteen is that Joel Osteen preaches what's called the prosperity gospel or the prosperity theology. Now, this is a little bit different than the law of attraction. Basically, law of attraction says you can attract good things to yourself by what you speak and what you say and what you believe. Prosperity theology or gospel basically says that included in the package deal in terms of Jesus going to the cross and dying for our sins, there is already included in that health and wealth. Meaning if you're a Christian, that comes with the package in terms of your salvation. Now, the problem with this is that whatever theolo theological perspective that you have, 
it can't just work in the Western culture. It can't just work in the United States whenever we have more of an abundance of everything. It also has to work in those third world countries of people who love the Lord with all of their heart, but for whatever reason, they are going without, they do not have proper medical attention, they, they, so therefore their health is not in order, and they also don't have a lot of money. So the question is, are they out of line with God? Are they living beneath their potential? Are they out of the will of God simply because they were born and they live in a third world country? You see, the Bible says, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. That means solid biblical teaching. You know why? Because it's not fun. It doesn't make people feel good. Uh, it doesn't interest us. It doesn't apply to our lives. It says, instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Who does not want to hear that God wants them to be rich? Who does not want to hear that God wants them to be healthy and wealthy and have an abundance and have favor? Everybody wants to hear that. So what do we do? We gather around ourselves people who are going to tell us these things on a consistent basis so that we can somehow uh, conjure up this belief system that one day, if I just believe enough, that God's going to give me all these things. But the problem is, when God does not give us these things, either A, we lose confidence in God because we feel like God has is, is, is not given us something that we were supposed to get, or we're experiencing a sense of guilt within ourselves because we feel like, man, maybe there's something wrong with my faith in terms of why I'm not receiving the blessings that God seems to have promised me and so that we internalize it for ourselves. Now, this sixth one is probably the most important out of all of them, and that is this. Joel Osteen basically denies that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. I want you to listen to this clip from an interview that was taken years ago from Larry King, where Larry King, I don't even know if he's a believer or not, but he asked Joel Osteen very clearly about uh, whether he believes that Jesus Christ is the only way. Uh, we've had ministers on who said, your record don't count. You either believe in Christ or you don't. If you believe in Christ, you are, you are going to heaven, and if you yeah. don't, no matter what you've done in your life, yeah. you ain't. Yeah, it's, I don't know, if, there's probably a, a balance between, I believe you have to know Christ, but I think that if you know Christ, if you're a believer in God, you're going to have some good works. And I think it's a cop-out to say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't ever do anything to well, help What anybody. if you're Jewish or Muslim and you don't accept Christ at all? You know, I, I just, I'm very careful about saying who and would and wouldn't go to heaven. I don't know. I think only God. Because you believe you have to believe in Christ. I so believe. They're, they're wrong, aren't they? Well, people? I don't know if I believe they're wrong. I believe here's what the Bible teaches. And from the Christian faith, this is what I believe. But I just think that only God can judge a person's heart. I've spent a lot of time in India with my father. And, uh, you know, I don't know all about their religion. But I know they love God. And I don't know. I'd have to, you know, I've seen their sincerity. So... I don't know. I just, I know for me and what the Bible teaches, I want to have a relationship with Jesus. But I want you to notice in that clip, he said, you know what? I went to India with my father and I met a lot of good Indians there. And man, they have good character. They have morality. They love God. They're good people. And so he's basically saying, I don't know if they're going to go to heaven or not. I'm going to leave that in the hands of God. It's not my place to judge. This is once again a major problem because the Bible very clearly says, well, let me back up. If they're an Indian, that means more than likely they are part of the Hindu uh, uh, religious belief. Hindus reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and as the only way to get to God the Father. Our Bible clearly says the only way to get to God the Father is through God the Son. There is no other way to have a relationship with God or to love God if you do not first love Jesus Christ, his Son. Now, if that sounds divisive, if, if that sounds exclusive, or if that sounds offensive, I'm sorry, but if you're a Christian, and more specifically a Christian minister, this this is clearly what the Bible teaches, and for us to say anything different would be heretical and veering away from the truth that is clearly revealed in the scriptures. Here's another clip where Joel Osteen is asked about the faith of a Mormon. And what about Mitt Romney? And, and I got to ask you the question, because it is a question whether it should be or not in this campaign, is a Mormon a true Christian? Well, in my mind, they are. 
Mitt Romney has said that he believes in Christ as his Savior, and that's what I believe. So, you know, I'm not the one to judge the, the little details of it. So I believe they are. And so, I, you know, Mitt Romney seems like a man of character and integrity to me. And um, I don't think he would anything would stop me from voting for him if that's what I felt like. Now here he says that because Mitt Romney is a nice person, he's got good character, he's got good morality, uh, and he seems to love God and he believes that Jesus is his Savior, quote unquote, that is enough for him. Now the problem here is not believing in Jesus. The question that we always have to ask nowadays is what do you believe about Jesus? Not do you believe in Jesus? And if you dig a little bit deeper in the Mormon faith, I'm gonna do a completely different video here coming up soon about uh, our Mormons Christians, but basically Mormons do not believe in the deity or the divine nature of Jesus Christ. They believe that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer, who as we know became Satan. In addition to that, Mormons also believe that there are four books that were inspired by God. The problem is that some of these books are contradictory to one another, and more importantly, contra contradicting certain truths that are found in the scriptures themselves. Now, I could go on and on about other things about Joel Osteen, but let me just end this video with this. Do you think that it is wise for a Christian to put themselves under someone who does not preach from the majority of the Bible. Also, when he does use the Bible, it's very, very few and far in between. Also, you will seldom, if ever, hear a message that's gonna convict you about your own personal sin. He also openly believes in a secular new age doctrine uh, called the law of attraction. And then he preaches this prosperity theology or this pre prosperity gospel that is clearly against the scripture, the, the, the gospel that's revealed in the scriptures. And most importantly, he does not understand or know or believe for some reason in his own words that Jesus Christ is the only way to get to heaven. Now, I am not going to tell you that you should or should not listen to Joel Osteen. If you have a discerning spirit and you are able to, as my seminary professor said, eat the meat and spit out the fat. You're able to hear what he's saying, get some truth out of it and get something out of it that will help you in your spiritual life, then praise God. Then you can take the things that he's given you that are true and apply them to your life and then discern and weed out the things that are not. The problem is the majority of Christians are probably not spiritually mature enough to really do that. And as a result, they're taking everything that this man and other preachers are saying to be truth and then as a result, they are living their lives according to something that is not true. So I know this was a very controversial subject. I would love to hear your thoughts. Please leave those in the comment section below. If you found this video helpful in any way, feel free to share it with a friend. Also, if you haven't done so already, I would love it if you would subscribe. Check out some of the other videos on this channel. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on The Beat. I think the thing we should get from that is uh, just what he said at the end. If you have a discerning spirit, and that means you can you can separate the wheat from the chaff, okay? Then you could you could take the good things that he says, meaning Joel says, and then you know push aside these other things and the major thing to push aside from Joel and and I believe this even before I saw this video is. For him saying that there are all kind of paths to get to to uh, to God to heaven, and uh, the scripture is clear. You know, I don't. Uh, I think I go more along with what Paul said, and he said, "Just don't even listen to that. Don't even listen to that. Whether you can discern and 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 separate the wheat from the chaff, well, okay, if you can, that's fine. But you know, it's kind of like." Would you listen to foolishness? Would you listen to mess? And so why would you subject yourself to have to pick out the part that's of value and that's true and that's biblical? Why would you do, why would you subject yourself to preaching like that? And I didn't, I mean, I heard of Joel Osteen. I've never really paid that much attention to him. So I didn't know these six things that Reverend Parr just revealed about it but i wouldn't i i wouldn't subject myself to have to listen to that and have to you know the whole time i'm listening say oh well throw that part out throw that part out throw that part out oh here's a little nugget 
you know, out of the whole 45 minutes that I can take. And um, uh, the people that are here with us in the class, I would love to hear your opinion about that. Would you, do you think that's okay to uh, subject yourself to something where only part of the sermon is really valid and biblical? You know, I would, I would agree with you that uh, I don't think I would want to do that at all. And because I don't think that, um, you know, if they're going to try to tell me this part is not true and this part is true in scripture and all that, they're not smart enough to tell me which, which one I should believe, which one I should reject. I take scripture as being inspired by God. And so I take it all in. And if you tell me this part is wrong, then to me, the whole thing must be wrong because I'm not in here to be taught wrong thing. Now, We've, uh, because of the difficulties we've had, we, we've kind of gone on. But I do want to kind of double back on um, to see if we can get. Why do you need more than one Rolls Royce? Well, why do you need more than one car? I mean, after all, it's yeah, boring well. riding in the same old Rolls Royce all the time. I feel the same way. <laughs> Mine also. <laughs> same thing. You get the same feeling, right? Different colors. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, are you wealthy? Yes, I am. To right. people. But. You could have a $300 watch. You don't need a $3,000 watch. You could have a Cadillac. No, what I need, need is for me to decide, not for somebody else to decide. My salary, that is a very good salary that my church and my ministry pay me, I deserve it. I earn it. At least some of uh, the information on Reverend Ike. Are you wealthy? Yes, I am. And I don't apologize for it. You have a lot of jewelry. I have some jewelry. Do you ever feel that that's a little at all? In other words, you never feel that it's a little ostentatious, that uh, you wear a fresh rose for appearance. I mean, I, it's very nice that your suits are very well probably handmade or made for, certainly tailor-made for you, that uh, people might have a dollar and they're giving 50 cents to you. I'm called, never bothers you. I am called to preach success and prosperity, and I must be an example of what I represent. Chet are a good example, though, of black capitalism at its best. And Jesus was a capitalist. That's why I'm a capitalist, because Jesus gave the parable of the men who had the different amounts of talent given to them by the Lord. And the person that did the most increase with his talent was the one that was congratulated and rewarded. And as a matter of fact, the person that did not do anything with his talent was the one that was condemned. How about his treatment of the money lenders? Well, Jesus was never for people being unfair, but Jesus was a capitalist and he demanded productivity. Very enlightening. Um, some of the things that you hear come out of the mouth of some of these people. And, and Reverend Ike was uh, uh, one of the strongest and un unapologetic of, of being rich and the amount of money that he has. And they ask him questions such as, well, do you feel bad that somebody is uh, who is... Uh, of meager means or poor or whatever is sending you their money while you have this huge house and uh, planes and uh, Rolls Royces and they ask the question why do you need two Rolls Royces you know and all that kind of thing or you know jewelry all all backed up and you know the best designer suits and all that kind of thing when would it not be okay for you to have maybe a, a one Rolls Royce or maybe even a Cadillac. Or maybe, you know, I mean, the whole purpose is to get from point A to point B. And and why do you need a home with 16 rooms? You know, could you deal with eight rooms or whatever? Or I deserve, I deserve uh, the money that I get. Wrong message to be sending to people. Prosperity gospel. Be very, very, very careful about the prosperity gospel because you will fall into the love of money and the love of money will send you straight to hell Amen. okay all right well I, um, that's a good one too people want to see okay and, and basically tony evans video says uh okay you've heard all this prosperity uh gospel let me tell you what it means to be truly rich truly rich all right In this series on the eternal perspective, I want to encourage and equip you to live the rest of your life victoriously. 
I want all of us to enter heaven with a celebration and not with a whole series of regrets. I want us to enter glory with hands raised high because at this point in our lives, we got it together. We started walking with God at a whole nother level. We started experiencing his power, doing his will, fulfilling his purpose, and engaging his priorities. And as a result, we saw his presence, his power, his handiwork move in our different portions of our existence in a marvelous way. I want to give you the secret of how to have a life down here that will matter up there because the perspective of there transformed your life and my life down here. That's why we all need an eternal perspective. Jesus, in chapter 12 of Luke, has been teaching. He comes to this place where he's teaching about the Holy Spirit and how important he is and critical he is for time and eternity. His teaching is interrupted by one of the listeners, one of the persons who was there listening to the sermon. He, he bloats out in the middle of the message. Someone, verse 13 says, in the crowd said to him, a listener to his teaching, teacher, because he's been teaching, Tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. When he asked Jesus this question of intervening, Jesus has a curious response. He says in verse 13, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter over you? Now, you need to know that the word you at the end of verse 14 is plural. You can be singular, you can be plural. It's plural. So Jesus is saying, who made me arbiter over y'all? If he was speaking Texan. <laughs> so the brother is there. The brother that the brother is talking about is there because he's he talking to both of them. Y'all want me to fix this money problem, this inheritance problem, these possession issues between the two of you. Why does Jesus respond to the man's request that way? Jesus was speaking about spiritual stuff. The man interrupts it with financial stuff. So Jesus responds by telling him, if you invite me into your family dispute about your will, your daddy's will, then you have to understand that when the teacher, me, gets into your family discussion, I'm not going to limit my answer to merely your earthly dilemma. My, my answer has got to deal with the root and not mainly the question of the fruit. You ask me about arbitrating the conflict between you and your brother, but there's actually something deeper going on. So I not only want to deal with what you ask, I want to deal with the motive that made you ask me about it. See, that's why a lot of folk don't want Jesus. Because they just want to hang out with the fruit and not get to the root. So Jesus now takes the conversation deeper than the question because he knew the heart that was behind the question. And in taking it deeper, it leads him to verse 15. Then he said to them, Beware, watch out, and be on guard for every form of greed for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions oh Jesus you didn't take in the man's simple question 
and turned it into something else. No, I turned it into what motivated him to ask me about it. See, because that's a problem with Jesus. He's going to deal with your motives and not just with your information. It's like when you're talking to somebody and you say to them, well, what are you really asking me? He says, watch out for every form greed takes. Greed in biblical terms has to deal with whether you have placed the physical ahead of the spiritual. Greed has to do with whether your pursuit of things has blocked God out. You are greedy even when you love the money that you don't have, that you want to have. Because your passionate pursuit of it, even if you don't have it, has blocked out the priority of God, God's will and God's kingdom in your life. And once God is made second, boxed out, and the physical trumps the spiritual, you have become greedy, or as the scripture calls it, the love of money or what money can buy has taken over you. Greed is the passionate pursuit of things at the expense of spiritual. So it is a priority issue. And he says greed comes in all forms. Watch out for every form of greed. Because you can be greedy in a whole lot of different ways. Oh, there is religious greed. Religious greed where the Bible and God are used to place the physical over the spiritual even though you sprinkle Jesus' name on it. It's called prosperity theology. God is not against prospering, but a theology that makes God your Santa Claus, that makes God your merely your financier is an unrighteous form of greed. Let me ask you a question. When God told Moses to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, where was God telling Moses to tell Pharaoh to let his people go to? Okay, I heard a couple of answers. Some said the promised land. Uh uh. He told him to tell Pharaoh, let my people go into the wilderness to worship me, not to the promised land. Why? Why did he tell him? Because everybody thinks in terms of, most people think in terms of, well, he was taking them to the promised land. Uh uh. He says, you tell him to tell him, let my people go into the wilderness and meet with me. Why? Before God ever wanted to give him the stuff, the land flowing with milk and honey, he says, I want you to hook up with me where there is no milk and honey. Where it's dry out there in the promised land. Where you're going to have to depend on me for water and manna and, and all the make it to the promised land. I want them to meet me before they meet my blessing. Because if they skip me and go directly to their blessing, they will get in so enthralled with their blessing that they will forget the me who met them in the wilderness. God does not mind you having a promised land as long as you do not skip him when you get there. And so he wanted to make sure that they hooked up with him first so that when the days were better and things were rolling in, that the spiritual did not get lost in the physical. My greatest concern is that you are a Christian 
and know of your salvation. Jesus Christ died on the cross in your place as your substitute to pay for your sins in order to give you eternal life. He has to give it away. It can't be earned. So if you will go to Jesus Christ now, acknowledge your need for a Savior because you recognize you are a sinner, and then place your trust in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins and for the gift of eternal life. He will grant that to you right here, right now. Go to him and simply say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I recognize I need a savior. I'm trusting you alone to be that savior. Enter my life now. Cleanse me, forgive me, and give me the eternal life you promised. Do that and you're on your way to heaven. He says, watch out for every form of greed. Why? He says at the end of verse 15, because even when one has an abundance, more than enough, his life, not even when one has more than enough, does his life consist of his possessions. Now, what's this got to do with an eternal perspective? Well, Jesus begins and says, well, let me tell you a story. He gives a parable, beginning in verse 16. He says, I want to tell you a story. He told them a parable, verse 16. The land of a rich man was very productive. So let's just stop there. We've got an entrepreneur. He is very, very successful. He's what every person dreams to be, productive in his life. And he was very productive. So this is the guy who worked hard, who took care of his business, and it was working out for him. Verse 17 tells us a little bit more about him. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, what should I do since I have no place to store my crops? This is what I will do. I will tear down my bonds and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. If you read this story, you will see him referring to himself 14 times. I, me, my, you. He keeps talking about himself. He says, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to plan this and I'm going to plan that. And where are you going with all this, mister? He said, and when I, when I get all this stuff where I want it to be, he says, then I will say to my soul, I will say to my soul, soul, You have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. It's time to retire. And he spent all of his waking, working time to make that dream of retirement occur. Is that a problem? Is, is Jesus downing, planning for the future? No. Let me tell you what he's doing. Jesus says, but God said to him, you fool. You fool. You didn't hear me. You fool. <laughs> What's the problem? This very night, your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? Here's our problem with our productive entrepreneur. He had a major miscalculation. He was assuming something. He was assuming he was going to get to retire. He, he, he was assuming he was going to make it to Social Security. He was assuming eat, drink, and be merry. It was all about his party in time. He was doing what many people do today. Put off God till I have time. Put off God till I don't have to work. Put off ministry to others when, until, until I can get around to it. Right now, 
I got a bill for my future. But he ran into two words. Two words that can reverse for good or for evil any scenario at any time but God. See, you can't leave those two words out of your equation because those two words can totally reverse your situation for good or for bad. But God. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 16 talks about those who are rich, those who wanted to be rich. And he says the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, but the love of it. Why? Because you put it before God. He says if God gives it to you, he gives it to you to enjoy, but he expects you not to lose him in the process of gaining it and not to forget others in the process of using it. This guy made it. But what he forgot along the way was that everything he was using to make it depended on God. Okay, let's, let's review. He had very productive land, but I don't think he made land. So the very system that he was building his productivity on depended on God creating property. His land was productive, which means he had rain. I don't think he made rain. Well, his productive land depended on sun. He ain't make that. His productivity that depended on land, sun, and rain needed seed. But he ain't make seed in a lab. It came from crops that already existed that had a system built into it to reproduce after its own kind, giving him seeds for more productivity than he started with. And even his own ability to get up in the morning depended on oxygen being present. So his whole reproduction, not only that, but the material he needed to build the bonds in order to store the crop depended upon raw material that had already been created. The wood came from trees that God planted. So there is no productivity without God. God does not want you to wait till you make it to include him. He doesn't want to have to wait till you finish school. Wait till you get that job. Wait till you get that promotion. Wait till you get that financial windfall. Wait till. He doesn't want you to wait till. Because he could call your name tonight. And then he says, now what will you do with what you have? Nothing, because you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You do not get to take it with you. What he is, he is not condemning it. He is not saying it's wrong as long as it's legitimate. We've got some business folk here or business folk wannabes. Entrepreneur wannabes, okay? So God has a special passage for you. It's in uh, James chapter 4, verses 13 and 16. He says, you businessmen, you say we're going to this city and that city to cut a deal and make a profit. That's what you say. That's what you say. He says, but what you ought to say is if it's the Lord's will, we're going to go to this city and that city and make a profit. Because you leave God out of even the planning of cutting the deal. You're on your own. Okay, so God, what's your point? What, you want? what do you want us to get out of this from an eternal perspective? He tells you in his closing verse, verse 21, so is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. There it is. He says, here's my point. He's talking to the man who wants Jesus to arbitrate between him and his brother. He says, you want to be rich for you, and there is no divine consideration in anything you are planning. You are planning this independently of God, because I want to get to the root. 
The more aware you are of your mortality, the more you live with different priorities. When our desire for stuff disconnects us from God, guess what he's saying? You're going to miss life. Rich in life can make you poor with God. Not because rich is wrong, but because misplacing God is wrong. He's, Jesus is saying, mister, don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Yes, plan. Yes, maximize what God gives you, but not at the expense of God. At whatever level God gives it. I like you uh, sit down and you watch TV and they got commercials about medicines designed to make you better. <laughs> they, they, to heal your sickness, to, to heal your hurts and your pains and they advertise these medicines because they are there to give you a better life to help you feel better. But then comes the warning. <laughs> Some commercials spend more time on the warning than the description of the benefit of the medicine. There is one commercial that says this medication will help you sleep. Beware, it may give you suicide thoughts. <laughs> Duh. What? Another medicine. This will heal you, but it could kill you. This world offers you medicine. The medicine of prosperity, the medicine of notoriety, the medicine of security, the medicine of, of prosperity. It offers you the medicine, but what this world does not do is give you the warning. Our job is to give you the warning that if you take the medicine of greed without the warning of danger, this medicine called affluenza can kill you. So don't leave God out if you want to have life and not just want to exist because a person's life does not consist of the things that he or she has. You know it's possible to be financially rich while being absolutely life poor. We've defined riches in the wrong way. Yes, you can be rich with money, but don't give up your life for it. You see, God's view of wealth or riches has to do with the wealth in the soul and everything else becomes a bonus. Nothing wrong with the bonus. We can buy things with the bonus, we can enjoy things with the bonus, but keep it as a bonus. It's not the source of authentic riches. Having a full life, a meaningful life, a purposeful life, a productive life, an, influen an influential life, a spiritual life. Oh, that's life. And all the other accoutrements, all the other extras that you can buy along the way, that you can own along the way, that you can drive along the way. All of those are, are wonderful bonuses. I, I believe in bonuses. God believes in bonuses. But don't mistake a bonus for the basic. And the basic is having a life that is full of value. It's rich toward God <laughs> while you are gaining or enjoying the things that are on earth. 
But when we are poor toward God, we are poor no matter how much stuff we have. That's when people have to go and use their riches to buy things to give them the life that they can't find. Well, guess what? God wants to give it away. Jesus calls it abundant life. That is a life of spiritual fulfillment. Don't sacrifice what money can buy for what money can't buy because what money can't buy is life. So I put up the, um, the graphic of a uh, demon at the door to bring us to let us know that we're, we're dealing with demonic spirits here and money is a good draw. And you see the little people at the bottom about to go through that door because of the money. Don't let that be you. <laughs> 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 that's, that's the <coughs> message you're getting across, huh? Yep. <clears throat> and, and I have to thank Sister Michelle for, for having a positive statement <laughs> since we had it up for a long time. I can't take it down, but uh, thanks for your positive statement, Sister Michelle. <laughs> now we're gonna leave. We're gonna leave this door, this door, but we're gonna go to a very powerful door the next time we meet in a couple weeks or three weeks down the road, and that is uh, and I've been holding this one off to last basically. That's uh, sex, and it's it's very appropriate now because the country is going through all this argument about. Uh, same sex, uh, uh, same genders and sex, same sex marriages and uh, Roe v. Wade and, and all that kind of thing. So uh, we're going to show you how to stand in the gap on God's word in reference to that when we get back. All right. Marvel, anything? No, just remember, I will post uh, these videos in our page. In this event, it'll be in the same page with the live event 
so you'll be able to find it and then uh, I'm gonna see if I can't edit something and put something together on YouTube that'll be more smooth okay well we appreciate that and as always you are IT person and you are you are it for us <laughs> <laughs> All right. We, next time we're going to meet, we're going to try to slam that door closed on sex for you. We're in the spirit world, of course. We're still, we're in, uh, and, and as I said, we're going to do sex, but we're also in spiritual warfare, as you know. And uh, you're in war. All right, let us pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you, Father, and, and we work through all the difficulties, Father, because all the times the difficulties a lot of times come from those not wanting this word to get out father and we know who that is we're in warfare and sometimes there's a disruption of communication but the word will never die and the word will always come back stronger than when it went out so father we want to thank you we want you to bless everybody who made their way here live father and everybody who's going to view this at a later time so, Father, we ask all this in your name and for your sake. Amen. Amen. Standing in the gap, standing for Jesus. Standing in the gap for family and friends. Standing in the gap, one love for all, so we all can make it in. Standing in the gap, standing for Jesus. Standing in the gap for family and friends. Standing in the gap, one love for all, so we all can make it in. Studying ourselves approved, rightly divine the word of truth, increasing our faith to envision our freedom, so we all can glorify our God, standing in the gap, standing for Jesus, standing in the gap for family and friends, standing in the gap, one love for all, so we all can make it in, make it in, make it in, make it in. Wanna hear him say good, good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say enter to the joy of the Lord. Wanna hear him say good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord. Wanna hear him say, good and good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord. Of the Lord, joy of the Lord. Lord, joy of the Lord.